He can come to you and tell you, Thus saith the Lord. And if your heart is open and your mind is ready to receive, God can speak to you through the man of God. Would you welcome a great friend and evangelist, Brother Tim Green. Amen. Is that a powerful message by Pastor right there? That was good stuff. Thank you for the word. Amen. I want to bring your attention. I won't be lengthy tonight, uh, at least in sermon, but we'll let the Holy Ghost do what the Holy Ghost wants to do in ministry. And direct your attention to Galatians chapter 6 and begin reading at verse 7. I'm very thankful to the Lord and to His servants for the tremendous ministry of worship. Are you thankful for the anointed praise team? Amen. So glad that they are working and ministering in their giftings and preparing that, stirring the gift and preparing the presence of God for us. And, uh, high honor to my wife today. And I'm wanting to really just say goodbye to everybody because once you hear her speak, it's all over for me. Yeah. But maybe you'll still let me come and carry her bags in the future when you have her come. Galatians chapter 6. Reading from verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. Be not deceived. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I feel like there's a breakthrough in the house that's begun to happen and God wants to continue in ministry in the place today. The very fact that Paul starts off as he writes to the church at Galatia for our understanding, he says, be not deceived, God is not mocked. Because there's absolutely a battle of deception that tries to make us feel and think that the word of God or the promises of God or the prophecies are not true. Or somehow we have erred or made mistakes or fallen and the promises of God will not happen. This is a battle that all of us face. In the Old Testament Psalms, we see a man named Asaph. Asaph wrote several of the Psalms we find in this poetry worship book. And here we find in Psalm 73, a psalm of Asaph. And he begins to lay this as a foundation when he declares this. When everything is else is gone, when all else is removed, this I know, verse 1. God is good to Israel, even to those who have a clean heart. So when he begins his statement in this Psalm 73, he's declaring, I know this. God is good to people. I know this. If you have a clean heart, God is good to you. He loves his people. But then he begins in verse 2 to be honest, even to a place of vulnerability in his honest that many perhaps would not go to. For he begins to declare, but as for me, my feet were almost gone and my steps had well nigh slipped. He said, I almost lost my way. I almost fell out with my relationship with God. And in verse 3, he tells us why. He said, because I began to get envious at the foolish when I lifted up my eyes and looked at the wicked and saw their prosperity. This is where we are easily deceived and hurt is in the journey that God has put us in, we decide to look at the wicked 
and to observe the foolish and to try to determine what is going on in their life. Sometimes this is not good. The scripture lets us know it is not wise to compare ourselves among ourselves. That we need to be careful when we look at things and Asaph, Asaph is here and he has said I almost messed up because I got envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Verse 4, he declared, When I looked at the wicked, there were no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. He said, It seems like the people that were wicked and evil and doing wrong things were strong and strengthened. They were not bound even to the place of their life being complete. He goes on to say that they're not even in trouble as other men are. They are not plagued. They're foolish. They're wicked. They're evil. And they're somehow getting away with it. No trouble. Not plagued. Verse 6, he said, Pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. Because seemingly they can do whatever wickedness and foolishness they want. And there's no problem. There's no judgment. There's no bands around them. Now they become proud in their foolishness. Proud in the statements that they make. Proud in the sin that they live in. Verse 7, their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than their heart could wish. He said they are so blessed that they're so fat, their eyes are bulging out of their head. They have everything they could possibly want. They seem to be so blessed they are fat with the blessings of life. And this is those that are wicked and foolish. It shouldn't be this way. Verse 8, they're corrupt. They speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. He said when they see people that are suffering or hurt, they speak loftily like somehow they are above them, that they have no touch with people that are bruised and wounded and, and here they're foolish and they're wicked and they're speaking these things. Verse 9, they set their mouth against the heavens. Their tongue walketh through the earth. It's like they have no concern about what mankind thinks. They have no respect for righteousness. They don't even care what God thinks. They have no respect for heaven or the things of God. They'll say whatever they want and do whatever they want. Therefore his people return hither, and waters of a full cup are wrung out to them. Shame that comes to the people. And they say, how doth God know? And is there no knowledge in the Most High? They are even snubbing their nose at God and saying, God doesn't know. I can do what I want. God doesn't care. Asaph said, I looked around and I saw the foolish and the wicked and they were getting away with whatever they wanted to do. And they were blessed and they were not, not their strength was not taken from them. And they had seemingly all of these blessings and they even mocked God with what they said and what they did. They said God doesn't even know. Verse 12, behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. And then he begins to look at his own life in verse 13 and say, verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. He said, what good is it that I've tried to live for God? What good is it that I'm trying to do what is right? Because those that are doing evil are not only getting away with it and not being punished, but they're prospering. They're being blessed. They do whatever they want and still seemingly there's no judgment for them. This doesn't seem to be right. It doesn't seem to be fair. It doesn't seem to be what the Word of God declares. Verse 14 is his introspection. He declares that all day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. He said, now it seems like I've been trying to do good, but in fact I'm getting punished because of what little things that I'm doing. And they're getting away with everything. Verse 15 seems to be the saddest verse for me. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. He said, I can't even talk about this because people won't understand. I can't even say how I truly feel 
I can't even be vulnerable and tell you what I'm dealing with because I'm going to offend somebody and they're going to feel like I'm saying God isn't real and God isn't this and stuff. He said, I can't even talk about what makes me want to fall or backslide or move away from my relationship with God. Verse 16 is the ultimate When I thought to understand this, to know this, to figure this out, it was too painful for me. He said, the best I can do is ignore what I'm seeing because it becomes a hurt in me. It becomes a confusion in me. I don't understand as I'm trying to live for God and trying to do the things I should, how those that are seemingly not doing this are getting away with what they want to. Verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I therein. Very thankful for the last 11 verses of chapter 73 that lets us know that Asaph had a vision in the house of God that straightened out his confusion and his misunderstanding and what he was looking and seeing. But this is absolutely a real thing that we deal with today. If you grew up in the church as a young person in a youth group, you know that this is what you lived with. Because very few secrets among the youth group. They know who's slipping around and doing this and that. They know who's involved in things that they shouldn't and that. And it will look like for a long time that things are just getting away with it. Pastor might not know. Youth leader might not know. Seemingly, they can still be involved in things and stuff. And it's easy to get your eyes on the foolish and become confused about who God is and what He is and who you are and what you are. I think this chapter has been a a statement of my life growing up in Pentecost. Because I have seen this even in my family. And my family is one of these um, blended families. My mom had my older sister, Betty, and then she had me. And while she was pregnant with my younger son, Tammy, my younger sister, that's who it is, my sister, Tammy. (laughs) While she was pregnant and my dad did not even know that she was pregnant yet. He had a car accident, and and his life was taken. So Betty and me and pregnant with this another little girl that she would have. And we were in San Bernardino, California at the time, and my stepdad, who had become my stepdad, lived in Atlanta, Georgia, and he had two children, a daughter and a son, with his beautiful wife, and she had cancer. And when she passed away and my dad had died, pastors got involved with some matchmaking and, and who would be my stepdad called my mom and they had many conversations. And it was expensive back then to call across country. <laughs> None of this satellite and cell phones and stuff. It was long distance. That was expensive. They wrote letters and had two dates. And then they got married. In fact... My stepdad did not meet me until the marriage because mom deemed it real important that he didn't meet me until after the marriage. (laughs) Perhaps he had changed his mind. I don't know. It was a blended family, and it happened to be staircase. My oldest, who would be my stepsister, and then my stepbrother, and then my real sister, and I was the middle child eventually, and then Tammy. Of course, they had to have two more of their own children, so we have step... It's, it's the Dudley bunch, you know, kind of like the Brady thing going And it's his children and her children and their children, and it was, oh, it was crazy. 
But dad, my stepdad, was a home mission pastor, Fayetteville, Georgia, and faithful, bivocational all of his life, and very faithful to the ministry and very faithful to his family. And he raised a church, and the church would go from maybe 50 people to 30 people and maybe up again to the 50s. And I think one time we were running almost 60-something, and then at times it seemed like it was just us and a couple of families, but just us was seven people. The church never got below seven or eight. You know, Grandma came to live with us. It was, And then the church would flow. And Dad was a tremendous minister one-on-one. He uh, could listen to people and talk to people and counsel and advice. And When he got behind a pulpit, he was not as skilled. It was difficult for him to read fluently. He would stumble over words and sometimes stumble over things. And in the, in the culture that we live in, it would be difficult for an individual that is less polished like that to build a group of people that would become members of a church. Their personalities drive so much the leadership of churches and the culture that we live in. So here we are, this blended family, but I remember at the age of five when mama prayed me through the gift of the Holy Ghost. Dad was so glad. Five years of age, got the Holy Ghost. And Tammy got the Holy Ghost, I believe, around eight. And Anthony was hard-headed. I think he was 12 before he got the Holy Ghost. Janine got the Holy Ghost young age. And Tina and Annette and all of us received the gift of the Holy Ghost growing up and by vocational pastor's home in this home mission church. And then things began to change as the family grew older. I remember the first time we were at a some kind of a She's for Christ rally, formerly known now as She's for Christ. <clears throat> and we were at a rally. We traveled like two hours to get there. We used to do this in the day. We had a big old blue van that took all of us there. And, and I remember that my sister got up to sing, my eldest sister, Janine. And as she was singing, because that's what they did at these meetings, every church represented there had to sing or, or preach or testify or something. And so, and so there they we were, and Janine was up singing, and one of the younger siblings was rummaging in her purse and found some things that showed an addiction that what she was dealing with and nobody knew. She's up singing, and here's these things. And it began to be a sticking point in our family. It wasn't long till Janine moved off to do what she wanted to do and to live the way she wanted to with no restrictions of some church telling her what to do. And then they began to get older and I watched my brother get involved in some things of pornography, begin to pursue some stuff with the neighborhood boys. And as we grew older, one by one, whatever their particular everyone drawn of their own lust, whatever their particular thing was, one by one, every one of my family backslid. Every one of my siblings, mom and dad, stayed faithful. I myself, at 18 years of age, walked away from the great heritage and the inheritance that I had. At 21 years of age, I found myself in a lot of trouble and realized that... (laughs) What I thought I was missing out there, I was really missing life in here. And so when God was so good and full of grace to call me back home, as the prodigal I came home smelling like the pig pen with all the trappings of the mistakes and failures of my life, and began to pursue at that time, 21 years of age, a restoration of what had been destroyed three years of backslidden, and and somehow to find the purpose I had in life. It wasn't long until God began to remind me of a calling to put on my life when I was a little kid. And at 22 years of age, I reaccepted if it was that calling of God in my life to do something for Him, to live for Him. God connected me in this time to the beautiful, angelic, luscious. Oh, that's Lois if you don't know who that is over there. <laughs> And we began to have a family very quickly and Morgan was born and what a beautiful little girl and Megan was born, not as beautiful. 
She's the most beautiful girl now, but I'm telling you, when she was born, I thought that's an alien. <clears throat> and then Jordan came, and, and Judah came, and our family began to grow. And it was difficult to watch, because while I'm trying to pursue a calling and live for God with all my heart, and my wife and my family being raised in the church. My siblings cared nothing for God. In fact, they turned their back on God. They raised their children not to even know who Jesus was. And while we are struggling a little bit financially in them days, trying to raise a family, trying to get a ministry, spending time in ministry when I could have, I guess, been spending time in career, but knowing the ministry was so important at the time. My siblings were blessed in their businesses, owning businesses, making big money. Their relationships were blessed, seemingly no problems. They had help. They had strength. And when I looked at them and them being so bitter and angry and mad at God, turning their nose up at the grace and mercy of God, it looked like there's no judgment. They're my family, and I don't want hurt to come to them. But it doesn't seem right that while they're doing all their wickedness and foolishness, they're getting away with it. And it looked like this for years. Five years. Ten years, they're blessed. Twenty years. In fact, sometimes what we don't understand is we don't even know how long the younger son is in that far land, riotous living, spending the blessing of his inheritance. And for all them years that he's spending the blessing of his inheritance, he's doing good, he's blessed, he's got inheritance, he's got friends, and it looks like there's no problem for his actions. How long sometimes the blessings and the inheritance of a family that has been raised in God, they live on year after year and their marriages are blessed because of a heritage and their health is blessed because of a heritage even though they're not living it anymore. We live in a world that is instant gratification and we instantly want to see the results of what we have sowed. But in the kingdom of God, everything is absolutely sowing and reaping. But it ain't necessarily sow today and reap tomorrow. <laughs> the problem with this name it and claim it message that is in the world and this in the religious world in some arenas and with the grab it and Blab it and grab it and all this, put a thousand dollars in the offering, God's gonna make you a millionaire. That is out of balance. Absolutely, you cannot outgive God. Absolutely, God will not be in debt to anybody. Absolutely, that's true. But don't think that you're gonna put that thousand dollars in the offering today and receive a million dollar check next week. God could do that, but for your salvation, that's going to be rare. In fact, in the kingdom of God, many things are lifetime that is sowed. And it takes a lifetime to reap. In fact, when you find that there's sure mercies of David, the things that David sows, it's ten generations later that they're reaping it. Some things aren't just what you do today, you reap tomorrow. It's why Paul writes to us in the text that we read. And so don't be deceived. It's easy to look around and be deceived. But don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, that you shall also reap. And so I'm looking at my family for 10 years. In 15 years, you've got to understand what we deal with at Christmas time when the families all get together. So, here's my new car. Where's yours, Tim? Come over to my house for Christmas and let me show you my 
half a million dollar mansion, you're still living in that same place, Tim. What good is your God doing for you? Look how we are being blessed. Their relationships, their children. In fact, it's only been maybe in the last five years. So we're speaking 28 years that it seemed like there was no consequences whatsoever. And now we began to see the crumbling as the inheritance of how they were raised has begun to run out. And the judgment, their actions, what they sold into the flesh is beginning to reap corruption. And as I tell you this, I, I tell you that my family is so private and if they even knew that I was sharing with you, they would be so mad. But this is my life. This is what I lived and what I have experienced. And now I have nieces that a few years ago, the niece decided she was so confused she wanted to be my nephew. So she went through all the process, confusion of who she was, gender confusion. Made all kind of changes. My, one of my nephews is so dealing with fear that he cannot come out of his house. He's on so many drugs to try to tame him down. But he cannot come out of the house. And the few times when he comes out for just for the family for perhaps Christmas, he's visibly shaking the whole time because of anxiety and fear. One of my brother-in-law shut himself in the bathroom. And there with a gun began to tell his family they're better off without him, that he's taken his life. And they begged and they cried and they asked him, please don't do that. And talked him down from that ledge where he was. And he has been diagnosed with, I believe, two or three types of clinical depression. He will never work another day of his life. So his business, his finances, and his houses all crumbling my sister has to go back to work and there to provide for the families the rest of their lives. Children of my siblings that have no respect at all for, their, for my brothers and sisters, their parents. Fear that has come into a place where they have bought into all the fears of the world. And what looked like they were getting away with for years. Now the horror of what they have been doing has come to roost. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And the mercy of God and the inheritance of an upbringing can somehow save you so long until we somehow get confused that we're getting away with something. Well, I did that and the pastor didn't find out. I did that and my family doesn't know. I did this and my spouse is not aware. But be not deceived. God will not be mocked. If you're sown into the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. You're not getting away with things. You're not fooling people. It's just the mercy and grace of God withholding trouble. It's just the inheritance you're living in. And the word of God is clear to us that God will not be mocked. Don't be deceived because if you're sown into the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. I look back at our youth group now. Our youth group. That I was raised in a powerful revival church in Atlanta. And those that even had callings on their life now have been married and divorced twice, some of them. Some of them who were in the altar speaking in tongues with me but then decided they would do their own thing. <laughs> They're now so far from God they don't even know where to find Him. Health is being destroyed. Relationships are destroyed. All the corruption of what they have sowed has come back. As they have sowed it, they are reaping. It is a story 
of caution that we need to hear, especially in this world where it's always about you and how good you are and you deserve this and you deserve that. The reality of the Word of God lets us know that if you sow into the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. But in that same chapter, I've come to preach good news to you. Because if you sow into the Spirit, <laughs> you shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So don't be deceived. Don't be confused. Don't feel like your prayers are not working. Don't feel like your testimony is not effective. Don't feel like you fasted for nothing. Don't feel like somehow you're never going to make it with God. You're never going to be a full overcomer. You're never going to be the prayer warrior, the minister. Because if you're sowing into the Spirit, you shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. This battle is just as deceptive when you sow it to the Spirit as it seemingly is when you think that you're getting away with stuff, sowing into the flesh because you give faithfully and you're a good steward and you try to live a faithful life. But there seems to be times that you're punished and God himself chastens you and you're not blessed in this area yet and this does not come to pass and that door does not open and it looks like all of your efforts are in vain. But not a single prayer that you have prayed is in vain. Not a single seed of righteousness that you've operated is in vain. But you just have to understand some things you sow today might be years in reaping. In Georgia, we are known not just for Peaches and peanuts and red clay between your toes. Georgie, as they say it down south. But also we have beautiful stands or groves, as you might call it, of pecan trees. Do you know what a pecan is here or is it a pecan here? What is it? Come on, I love you guys. Pecan, that's right. That pecan is something else that you had way back in the years when you didn't want to go to the outhouse. <laughs> pecan. And there is a type of pecan. It's a thin shell Georgia pecan. And these are very tasty. But from the time that a pecan tree is planted, these thin shell pecans, it is 30 years from the time it's first planted to when it gives forth its first crops. That's insight. You don't plant that in your old age expecting to reap a harvest. If you plant it in your old age, you're doing it for your generations to follow. But to have insight to realize that if I plant this, I might not get anything for 30 years. But then the harvest will happen. So to sow the seed and to do the due diligence to make sure the trees are healthy and growing and they will produce the harvest one day takes insight. It takes faith that lasts years after year after year. Think about it. Someone just graduating high school is not going to receive their harvest as they plant that Georgia pecan until they're well in their middle age. Some things in the kingdom of God are years in happening. Both what you flow, sow into the flesh and also what you sow into the spirit. This is why you have to hear the word again. Don't be deceived. I know you've prayed that prayer. Don't be deceived. I know you fasted. Don't be deceived. I know you ministered. I know you reached out. I know you interceded. I know you taught that Bible study. I know, but don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, that you shall also reap. Reap. 
today, I look at my family and the health that so many of my siblings lack and the relationship troubles that so many of them have. And some have children by several different husbands and, or several different men, some baby daddies, some husbands. It's, it's just a mess, and we all came from the same family, raised in the same church. But they sold into the flesh and thought they'd get away with it. And years later, the blessings of God are becoming evident to my siblings. And they are often saying to us, how God has blessed you, Tim. How God has given you wisdom in raising your children. And they see perhaps the difference in my children, their children maybe. They see the difference in where we are and where they are, what they're struggling with, what we don't have to struggle with. And it's a witness and a testimony. And we're beginning to see all over again a living epistle reaching to backslidden siblings. And things are beginning to happen in my family. And I'm trusting God at revival. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, that you shall also reap. But I tell you what I'm seeing in this generation is that I'm seeing fields that are full of wheat and full of tares. Because we're sowing in the Spirit and praying in the Holy Ghost and dancing, shouting, and worshiping, and we're sowing into the flesh as well. And seemingly living with feet in both worlds. Passionate about spiritual things. Have a true desire and a hunger for the things of God. Love God. But then so pressured that we are still living so much of the flesh. We are raising a generation of spirit-filled individuals with all the symptoms of backslidden people. And fear and anxiety is among us instead of faith and hope. And brokenness of relationship is among us instead of the strong relationship in the proper place. Because while we have been sowing into the Spirit, we have not cut off the flesh. And we've allowed to be sowed into our flesh all the verbiage of the social medias, all the verbiage of the gods of our world, higher educations, all the verbiage of what the world declares is science and truths, all the verbiage of these things which lift themselves and exalt themselves higher than the Word of God, which let the Word of God lets us know is a stronghold in our life. And so we have individuals living in a field where they have sowed into the Spirit and the beautiful wheat of the Spirit has come up. And then because we have allowed so much of the flesh to be within us and we have sowed in that, then so many tares, as the Scripture speaks about, is in our lives as well. There must be a recommitting and an understanding to the Word of God that the kingdom of God is like this. When you find the pearl of great price, you sell everything out and you do everything you can to get that pearl. And that pearl of great price becomes your lifestyle and your habit and the way you live and the way you walk. The kingdom of heaven we need to re-understand and recommit is like this. It's like that one that finds a treasure. And when you find the treasure, you, you sell everything you've got to buy the field because that's where the treasure is. And everything else is sold out. You pick up your cross and you follow him. And nothing else matters if you have to leave mother, father, sister, brother and walk away from all. It's Jesus that's most important. I know I'm preaching to this generation 
but we have become so intoxicated with the world liking us that we don't want to pick up our cross anymore. There has been a time because of where we have gone through as a people in a spiritual world where we have been accepted in our world. When I grew up, we were absolutely despised because of the way we dressed, because of where we would go, where we wouldn't go. We were spoke about, we were talked about, but it seems like through the past few years, the world just kind of has been so tolerant that we accept everything. Even those who want to walk the way we have walked. Even though seemingly and the world has been tolerant of us and accepted of us. But we're moving into a place where that's not so anymore. And if we're intoxicated on the world loving us and have to have the world loving us, we're going to miss what the Spirit is leading and speaking to us in these last days. I'm just opening up my heart and talking to us for just a few moments because we are at a destiny moment in the church and God is speaking to us of the last of the last days with great revival and great outpouring. But I'm telling you, the world is not going to like it because we are going to have to make some true stands against sin and against the work of the flesh. We're going to have to make some true stands against what's happening, even when it's accepted by governments. Even when it's politically accepted, we're going to have to declare that's not truth. We're going to have to stand up. That's where we're being led in the next few years. That's where we're going. And so we have to make a decision. It's time to sell out and sow into the Spirit. And get these breakthroughs and deliverances that we need. Past these fears and anxieties and these addictions in our life that live among us. Past these problems, these weights that easily beset us. And we've got to sow into the Spirit so we can of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And quit sowing into the flesh because it's causing tears and weeds in the garden of our life. God is calling us back to a place where we'll live for him even if the world hates us. This is where we're going. This is where we're at. This is what the Spirit is saying. So while we have over and over received the presence in the Spirit of God and worshipped, done great things so in the Spirit, It's time that we understand we can't continue to keep one foot in the Spirit and one foot sowing into the flesh. It's why we're dealing with so much that really is worldly stuff in our our homes, in our churches, in our lives. But it's time to sell out to sow it in the Spirit so that we're reaping a field of spiritual life everlasting and not having all these tears these weeds in our life that we're constantly having to deal with. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever you sow, that shall you also reap. I want you to stand with me. I feel like the Holy Ghost wants us to have a breakthrough and a deliverance. That some of the things that have held us back for so long, yes, you're in the church. Yes, you've been sown in the Spirit. Don't be deceived. That seed will come to harvest. You will be blessed. But we've got to quit sowing into two fields. This is what we're dealing with in churches. In churches, we're having dissension or disunity among the people because of what is being spoken politically. We're sowing too much into what's happening in this world and not enough in the Spirit. People are getting mad and deciding they'll go to another church because 
you're preaching the spirit behind what's happening in our world today. And they've sown so much into a political agenda. It's amazing how careful you got to be today when you talk about in Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's no black, there's no white, there's no brown in Christ. And some have sold into a fleshly ideology. And there's disunity among the brethren because some feel like their particular race, not in Christ. We're all brothers and sisters. You're buying into some field that's not. When you let this sow in, the only way something dies is you cut off its food supply. You cut the head of that off. You you quit receiving that with your eyes or your ears or your mind. You don't believe that word that's being spoken, all the words, and you go back to the word of God and says, this is who I am. This is what I believe. This is how I live, regardless of if the world likes me. or Political correctness is a tool of the enemy. And if we have to have the world loving us, we're going to miss what God is doing. The promise is so clear. Every prayer you've prayed, every worship you've lifted, every ministry, every invitation, every teaching, every by everything, that not one of that seed will go unrewarded. You shall reap. And it's just as clear in the other way. If we let all of this feed the fleshly and corruption of the mind, then our feet are in one field with weeds and our feet's in the other field with tares. And we are bringing things into the kingdom that were never meant to be kingdom problems. I'm asking God to deliver me today. To deliver me from this intoxication that the world loves me. And to believe the world all over again that they hated Jesus. They're going to hate us. And to make the stand that now we've got to make to take this whole world. But give me Jesus. Doesn't matter how tough it gets. If this is what the Word of God says, that's what I'll do. Doesn't matter how much political pressure, political correctness, whatever the Word of God says, that I will do. That I'm not white, I'm not black, I'm a Christian, I'm a child of God. I'm not conservative, I'm not liberal, I'm not Republican, I'm not Democrat, I'm a child of God. That that's what is the most important in my life. And these other things have to be distant, distant in priority. I'm asking God to deliver me today. So that I have faith to stand. From a child, I have felt challenged of the Holy Ghost. I raised my kids with this. They told me I scarred them. But I, from a child, and I told my kids this when I was a young parent, that I don't know, Morgan, Megan, there might come a day when like happens in overseas places, China today, Russia back in the day, that they will charge into our churches and say, deny Christ or we take your life. That sounds so foreign from where we are today. But there might be a day when that happens. And you need to know, baby doll, that uh, dad's not denying Jesus. And if I give my life for the sake of my belief in God, then you rejoice with me. That's always been my heartbeat. But yet I'm struggling with the world not liking me, with the world not wanting to hear my messages on YouTube, 
with me not being a popular person among the world. I'm struggling. The Holy Ghost is challenging me. It's time for deliverance of that intoxication of the world loving us. Because we cannot be deceived. God is not mocked. And we have been reaping things that we have been sowing. Yes, in the spirit, but also in the flesh. And it's time to die daily. And to be a Christian. And if I could stand here and say that they could walk in and declare, I'm going to take your life if you don't deny Jesus. And I'd say, take my life. Because Jesus has been the best thing that's ever happened to me. Then on a daily basis, I have to stand and say, you know what? It doesn't matter what you say about me or do about me or how much you love me or don't love me. I'll love you. I'll reach for you in truth. But I've got to live what thus saith the word of God. I've got to live righteously and holy before God. God, is there a deliverance that you have for your people today? That we would fall more in love with Jesus than acceptance of the world. That we'd be willing, if it need be, to walk away from mother, brother, sister, family and follow Jesus. That we wouldn't get any more likes on Facebook because we took a stand for righteousness and holiness. Maybe they'd even ban us from social medias. Maybe the short opportunity we have to put the message on YouTube and Facebook Live might be revoked. Yeah, we're coming there. But is there God a deliverance? That would settle in our mind. So in the spirit, so in the spirit, so in the spirit. Be careful not to let this sowing of the flesh happen. And deliver us from that battle, from that struggle, from that lack of respect and knowledge of who we are in you. And if there's a deliverance today, then let me be first, God. Cleanse me. Forgive me for feeding the flesh and let the Spirit rise up in strength. Let me die daily again to the flesh so the Spirit lives in me again. In Jesus' name. I know that there's people in this place that have made that same thing in their heart and their mind that they would never deny Christ in front of a pistol, in front of a threat. But are there people in the place that also want to declare on a daily basis, I'll not deny the Word of God in my life, Christ in my life, and I will sow into the Spirit not let all this sow it into my mind and believing that and receiving that and walking in all the stuff of the world that I'll not sow into the flesh that I'm making a step right now anybody want to sign up for what God is doing in this next dispensation Anybody ready to say, well, I, I'm ready to just deny everything. I'm ready to. I'm ready to. 